All right, cool. So hi everyone, my name is Sinem. I'm the Vice President of Sydney University Law Society and I head the education portfolio. I am joined by two education event coordinators, Maddie and Ashvini. Would you like to introduce yourselves guys? Sure, hi everyone, I'm Maddie. Um, I'm in my fourth year um, and I'm from Arts in International Relations. Hi everyone, my name is Ashvini Sibin and I'm my second year. Awesome. So welcome to the second panel in the annual Law School Basics series. We are kindly sponsored by Allen and Overy. So big thank you to them for their gen generosity in getting these sessions to you. So today's panel is going to be about all things assignment. So how to go about different types of assignments, how to structure them and more. The panel will consist of three law school faculty members, Professor Peter Durangelis, who teaches FedCon, Professor David Hammer, who teaches evidence, and Dr. Jason Chin, who also teaches evidence, and a final year elective psychology and law. We will also have a high achieving final year student, Gordon Yen, with us on the panel to provide a student perspective in all of this. Thank you all of you um, for kindly volunteering your time to be with us today. But first, we would like to invite Associate Professor Ed Cousins to give a little talk on education integrity. Since you all will be embarking on the adventures of referencing and your assessments, or perhaps you've already dabbled with it, you would have noticed that the law school puts a lot of emphasis on avoiding plagiarism and maintaining academic integrity. We're going to get a bit more information on this matter, so feel free to start, Professor Ed. Okay, I'm ready to go. Hello all. My, one of my current roles is that I am the Education Integrity Officer um, for the Law School for the first semester of 2021. Um, it's not altogether um, an unpleasant task because we do have the interest of uh, being able to sit at graduation ceremonies um, after doing this job for a few years and seeing students go by and say, oh yes, I know that student, oh, I plagiarized, I, I prosecuted her, etc. You know, she was fun. But apart from that, apart from that one little um, peccadillo, it's really one of the most unpleasant tasks um, you could have. Um, the last thing that we really want to do is find students to be guilty of academic dishonesty. It's not something any lecturer wants to be involved in, but it is something that the law school and the whole university takes incredibly seriously. Academic integrity is seminal to what we do here. The entire reputation of the university, in fact, it's very reason for being a university and the reason why you and other students have chosen to come and study at the University of Sydney is because of its reputation for high academic integrity. And this goes to trust in all sorts of different ways. There's a reason why we, when we choose who we're going to take medical advice from, and we're saying on the one hand, Donald Trump, on the other hand, Anthony Fauci. And I'm not uh, prescribing to you which um, of those two people you should take medical advice from. What I'm saying is that your choice will depend on how you feel about integrity and trust. And that is crucial. That's what we're trying to get across here. Now, it probably isn't altogether fair, but for law students, the consequences of being found to have committed a dishonest practice are potentially greater than for many other professions. Such a finding can even prevent you from entering your chosen profession, can act as a barrier from being admitted by the law profession. I was looking recently at a, an interesting document, which is the Guide for Applicants for Admission as a Lawyer in New South Wales, um, updated as of December 2020. And I was looking at it to see what the particular consequences were for students and what their duties of disclosure are, if they have ever been found guilty of an offence involving dishonesty. Now, what was caught my eye, however, was um, a small section of guidance on the matters that you should disclose. And I was looking at the, uh, 
the traffic offenses. And the examples they give include that you have ever had a fine for using a mobile phone while driving. You should disclose that to the Law Society. If you have had parking fines, you should disclose them. I mean, it sounds incredible, but that's what's in the guidance given. Now, that might strike us as ridiculous, but how much more so, how much more trouble will you be in if you do not disclose a finding against you involving academic dishonesty, as opposed to a fine for having parked over a yellow line, for example. Now, why does the law student's profession take this so seriously? Ultimately, it's because legal integrity is absolutely seminal to the legal profession. Um, there are reasons why lawyers cannot be compelled to disclose matters that their clients have divulged to them in the course of consultations. There are reasons why lawyers cannot be compelled to testify against their own clients. Integrity is taken incredibly seriously. Now, when you look at the university's core policy document, the Academic Honesty and Course Policy Fund, that's its um, untrendy name, uh, it's, it's updated regularly, so although it's 2015, that's just the year it was, it first made its appearance. And we look at clause three, statement of intent. This policy states the university's unequivocal opposition to and intolerance of plagiarism and academic dishonesty. Now, plagiarism is essentially a form of academic dishonesty, but academic dishonesty can be considerably wider than that. You may not appreciate until you've actually looked at the documents just how wide that can be. And think of some examples. You have a friend who is battling with an assignment. You did the unit the year before. You give your friend your assignment to look at. Your friend then uses that draws that constitutes academic dishonesty. And not just on the student's part, on your part. Take another example. Um, assisting is one thing. Drawing from various sources often trips students up. There is a bewildering array of sources. Students sometimes battle to understand why they can't use their own previous work submitted to this or another university. That's called recycling, and that is a form of academic dishonesty. Now, I could just, I, I don't have time in five minutes to explain all, but I'll simply list a few catchphrases or keywords. Recycling, dishonest plagiarism, collusion, contract cheating, fabricating data, assisting another student to obtain an academic advantage, inappropriate publication or upload of an assessment, university materials to a file sharing or other online platform. Many students would not appreciate at once that they can be guilty of academic dishonesty by uploading materials, even materials that they have themselves written, to file sharing websites or to commercial websites which make university materials available for purchase. Plagiarism essentially means presenting another person's work or reproducing somebody else's work, including ideas, as your own without appropriate acknowledgments. And plagiarism is unacceptable acceptable in academic work. Ignorance is not an excuse and lack of intent to deceive is not an excuse. Now the types of plagiarism and the types of academic dishonesty which we see range from the straightforward, a student 
copying and pasting from a source without using quotation marks to indicate where that source was, came from or which are words directly drawn from that source and which are not. A student might, for instance, draw from a source, properly acknowledge that source, but not use quotation marks. And that becomes a form of dishonesty because you can mislead your examiner into believing that you have paraphrased a source into your own words. That, that's perhaps at the, the bottom end of the spectrum, where it has not understood properly and has um, essentially made a mess up. Right through to the other extreme, where a student pays a commercial company to write an essay for him or her. Now, I'll round this off by saying that we do understand that most students are honest and that usually when students cheat, it is because they have not understood requirements or because they are desperate and rushed. The answer though is never to take shortcuts, never to take risks, never to cheat, um, never even to risk cheating even if you do not know whether what you're doing is actually plagiarism or not. The answer is always to seek help rather than to take a risk. Rather approach your lecturer, explain your situation, submit the essay late, accept a, a mark penalty, but get it right, rather than risk your entire career for the sake of um, uh, fixing your um, own lack of preparedness. I'll finish by saying that there is help available. It's part of our job and our duty to assist students and to explain these requirements properly. Um, I recently gave uh, three presentations of about an hour each to the LLBs, to the JDs, and to the um, JD part-times. And these were the incoming students. I, I don't know who, exactly who my audience is today, and you might not be students who've just joined. You might have been going for a year or two. Um, so you might not have received those presentations. They are available. And they have made available through the, um, the website and the various web pages that the university, that the School of Law is compiling and making available for students. Okay, I'm, I think that hopefully having scared you witless, I look forward to seeing you at graduation and not knowing who you are. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ed. That really appreciate you making that time to speak to us about this really important issue that we want to protect students from going through. That's why we have asked Ed to come in and speak about this, especially with online uh, exams and things like that. It's really easy to copy and paste now during assessments. So, but we want to protect students from having to like go through that stress of being caught out or, and even when they really are just trying their best. So, um, yeah. So what we are going to do now is we're going to direct some questions at each of the panelists, but just a note to the panelists, you can jump into any of the questions that you feel like, oh, I want to say this about that question as well. It hasn't been covered. So feel free to uh, jump in whenever. And also people listening, feel free to write in some questions, type in some questions into the chat box so we can address it if we have some time at the end. I'm sure we'll have some time. So yeah, Maddie, let's get started with the questions. Sure. So um, my first question is mainly for Jason, but again, anyone can jump in. Um, how much time should we leave for an assignment? How much, like when should we start? Thanks, uh, Maddie. It, well, really, I think it depends a lot on the, the nature of the assignment. So uh, what kind of assignment were you, were you thinking about? Um, I guess it, yeah, I agree with you. It absolutely depends. Um, how about we could go through the main um, kind of assignments that we would get? So I guess the, um, the one that's first coming up soon for a lot of people would be like a mid-SEM take home and then maybe a mid-SEM um, like a test, like an exam. Yeah, so again, that is still, it will still depend a bit, and I'm, I'd be happy to hear from the other people about this as well. But uh, my own view is that it's, it's really, it's never too early to start, start preparing. So if you're, um, 
uh, keeping on top of the readings. These are keeping a um, pretty uh, accurate and, and useful um, like outline as you go. Uh, but maybe in my own experience, and I don't really have much evidence to back this up, uh, like the, the actual kind of preparation uh, for a specific assessment, I, I used to do it about, about two weeks before the start. Again, it, that was my own, my own thing. Um, and more generally, just while I have the microphone, because um, I do have to leave early, unfortunately. Um, uh, I really think uh, that like active studying is the best thing to do. So I think, I think this actually is research based. Um, just just being and reviewing materials is probably useful, but not not that useful. But trying to actively engage with it either by creating some sort of like mental map or outline, or even better, uh, if you have some friends and, and you all pick a certain section to try to teach that material to them, because that's often when you realize that you're missing something. Thank you for the question. No, no worries. Um, the next question, oh, Ashwini, actually, I think you had a question. Yeah, thanks, Sinem. Um, So Dr. Jason, this is another one for you. So what is the difference between a problem question and an essay assignment in terms of how would we approach it differently? Sure, yeah, and again, I am happy to have the others jump in because they, they probably have more experience with this. Um, I think we'll probably all agree that a little bit more, well, oftentimes, like some, an essay will have a research component to it. Uh, and so we'll be looking for the more the degree to which you've engaged with that research and done a relatively comprehensive job. Uh, and I think there's more creativity and um, uh, exploration that goes into a, a an essay so the problem question we're kind of just looking to see that you've uh, identified all of the issues engaged with all of the issues identified the most the strongest precedents uh, and I think perhaps even like a very extraordinary one will note that some of the issues are sort of stronger or more pressing issues than the other ones which may be the you know the actual arguments that the person could raise are, are pretty weak so you so you spend some time on the ones that are quite close but yeah i would i'd be happy to pass to ed or, or david or peter well i'd just like to pop in there thanks for the question just very quickly i think basically i think um a problem question usually involves uh, uh, a legal problem in the sense that you need to resolve the problem. You need to be careful what you're asked. So if you're asked um, to advocate a position, I mean, that would be a different approach, but usually it's in the form of an advice. And so look at very carefully what you're being asked. And then of course, it's just a question of <clears throat> identifying legal principles. Uh, and applying those principles to the facts, you've got to stay pretty close to the facts. So it's a very traditional form of legal activity, which is the sort of thing you'll be doing in practice in any event, which is advising on a, on a piece. So it's purely focused on that. Uh, and as um, Jason's pointed out, an essay usually is um, asking you a general question about, you know, discuss this or that. But with an essay, of course, bear in mind, of course you must understand what your convener or lecturer is asking of you. But the traditional form of an essay is an argument, isn't it? It's you're, you're adopting a position and then you're defending that position uh, throughout the essay to come to a conclusion. And I think that general form must be observed. So a narrative won't get you there. I mean, I, I have a major research essay in my advanced elective constitutional law. Um, and sometimes you just see, despite my advice, students just go through a narrative, the law basically developed this way. Whereas that's not what you're being asked. Anybody can do that. You're being asked to develop an argument and then to defend that consistently through the paper, deal with contrary views and then come to a conclusion. I won't say more, but as a general rule, that tends to be the form of an essay as opposed to a legal problem, but it depends on what the specific assignment is in each individual course. 
Um, we actually have a question for you, Professor Durangelos. Um, it is how much reading should we be doing for each assignment? So for example, if there's an essay assignment, I guess that would be more applicable to this question. To this question. Uh, how much reading should we be doing for an essay? Well, isn't there that old saying that you can never be rich enough or thin enough? Uh, <laughs> um, you can never do enough reading is the, is the answer. But of course, that's in theory. We are all pressed uh, with other um, uh, assignments and assessments and other courses and uh, other commitments. So it's a question of uh, prioritising your time. Um, look, it really depends, again, on what you're being asked. Usually, um, the convener will tell you what, what you need to read in order to answer that essay. Now, for example, in my own uh, FedCon assignment, uh, I mean, I tell the students it's a legal problem that you just need to stick to the case book, the main reference book, study guides and notes from lectures, and that will that's more than enough to answer the problem. Uh, in the essays that I do for, of course, the elective, I set out a set of basic readings, but I tell the students you've then got to go on and unlimited, it's unlimited how much they then have to do. But in an intermediate case, such as an assignment, I suppose in a compulsory course, there would be some indication, would there not, of the, the types of readings you need to do. Um, I don't think you should overdo it, um, but at the same time, don't underdo it either. So really you've got to assess the, the assignment, how much it's worth, and the indications from your lecturer. So the basic answer to that question, how much reading I should be doing, that sort of information should be given to you by the convener or your lecturer. And if it's not being given, you should ask um, because there should be guidelines for that, okay? And finally, it, as I say, it depends on the length. So in say the my advanced elective, if you do a, major research essay as your assignment option as opposed to a, a comp well a moot an assessment moot with written submissions if you do the you've got the whole semester to do it so i expect obviously much more than i would expect if i was doing a, a 2000 word or a 1500 word essay in a compulsory course so that's my basic answer yeah Thanks. i hope that helps yes yeah, it was perfect. Um, I actually have a bit of a follow-up question to that. I think a lot of first years and people early on in the law degree get really overwhelmed with the unit of study outline and see that amount of readings and sometimes a whole book will be mentioned in the readings of really long. How can students address that sense of overwhelm with all these readings and filter through? Is that for me? Yeah. yeah all right, I'll, I'll start and I'll... Well, I think this is a common university experience. I mean, I certainly had this myself. Uh, I did an arts degree initially and uh, in the part of my combined degree and the amount of readings were just overwhelming, uh, especially in history. So you'd often have three or four books for one week in the tutorial that you had to. Um, so there's no easy answer to that. I think, again, guideline, uh, guidelines are, are needed. Um, for you, but I think in first year, I think students need to understand that it, it is another level, completely different level, and the amount of reading you need to do is heightened. Let me just give you one point though. It's how you read. It's not like secondary school where everything you read is in a sense meant to be digested. The reading is just read it. Uh, don't, unless you're told that this is examinable, you need to stop. Just read it and whatever sinks in, sinks in and just keep going. And eventually you get the hang of it. But the critical piece of advice I want to give to students is that if they're feeling overwhelmed, that's normal. That's part of that stepping up process. But don't let, allow yourself to get so overwhelmed that you, you're unable to continue. I mean, that's what we don't want to happen. Um, but I think it's true and to make the point on the side of the students. Sometimes we as academics perhaps overdo it a bit and perhaps we set too many readings. But if we do that, I think we've got to clarify these readings are essential. Make sure you read these. These are for those of you that want to explore further 
and have the time to read further, or are, are interested in a particular aspect of the topic, read this book, etc. Um, but again, my bottom line answer is if you're feeling overwhelmed with that precise question, approach the lecturer. Now, some of you might say the lecturer isn't very approachable. Well, that's the lecturer's problem. It shouldn't be yours because lecturers should be approachable um, to answer questions like this. I'm not talking about students that are being vexatious with you know, overdoing the questions, but reasonable questions like that should be the proper province of lecturers to answer. Okay, so seek guidance if you're not sure. Could I just um, add something there? Um, can you hear me? All good, yeah. Great, thanks. So I agree with everything Peter said, as I so often do. Um, but one of the general skills that the students need to develop, and this is really a key skill, which is relevant to many of the questions that have been asked, um, is time management. You know, students need to be aware of all the demands that are placed on them, you know, not only with university work, but also paid work and other interests they have. They have to be on, on top of all that and then find, you know, prioritise, decide what is essential to get done and make sure they have time for that. So, you know, with the first question that you asked at the beginning, how much time for an assignment? As Jason said, it really depends. But um, it's up to the student to determine, well, what work do I need to do for the assignment? No, I need to, if it's an essay question, I need to you know, go and seek out relevant sources. I need to read them. I need a bit of extra time to follow up further references. I then need to draft you know, the, the essay and I need time to kind of read through it and to redraft it. And I need time to fix the references at the end. And also, it's a pretty good idea, I think, for students to have someone read and provide feedback on their writing, because that's, that's key, really, to improve, improving your writing, to have somebody read it. It's, it's often very hard to judge your own writing, but to have someone else read it and give you feedback on it, um, that can be extremely useful. Of course, you know, in doing that, if you do get someone to read your assignment for you, of course, you'd have to be aware of the um, education integrity limits on that. And if there's time at some point, I might direct people to the relevant um, clause in the procedures. But you can get people, you can get someone to read your work and give you general feedback. They can't tell you how to write it, but they can give you general feedback on, on structure and clarity and, and grammar, for example. So I think that's, it's useful to schedule time for that step when you're writing an essay or for that matter, a problem. If, if I may just jump in, I, I'm also not going to stay very much longer, but I, I'd just like to follow up on what um, both Peter and David have said um, and talk about the, the numbers of publications that you cite, et cetera, and you know, how many, articles should you read? How many books should you quote from? And I, I have seen master's essays with not one single credible journal publication on their bibliographies. And that means that the student has not done an adequate research job. I've also seen um, master's essay so I'm using the example of masters because it, it filters down all the way through, but the master's students should be at a higher level. And I've seen master's essays where the student has quoted dozens of articles. Sometimes more than 100 articles have been quoted. And the student has made a point of quoting from every single one of those to show the examiner just how much work that they have done. And it becomes an almost unintelligible mess because if you're quoting from a single, a, a single sentence from dozens of articles, your essay really comes across very, very badly. What we're looking for is proper engagement with your sources. So that's the, the real key, I think, is not how many sources you've used, not how many articles you've read, but the quality of your engagement with those 
the extent to which you have taken an author's thesis, considered it, considered whether there are authors who have criticized that author or authors who that author had built upon, and then having presented these different arguments, sought to draw your own evidence-based conclusion from it. So what really is important, the answer to how many sources you should use, I think, is the appropriate number. However many are appropriate for you to engage properly with the question that you're answering. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, so once we have um, done the amount of readings we think appropriate for the specific assignment and we've um, thought about what we're going to use, what we won't use, and we've got all this information, how do we kind of funnel that down into structuring a problem question or structuring an essay? Um, and Gordon, if you'd like to give a student perspective um, on this as well, like once you've got all this different information, you've got a lot of thoughts in your head, how do we really get that into a structured piece of writing? Um, I'm happy to start. Thank you for the question. Um, I think Obviously, problem question as they have a very different structure, and I'll, I'll probably start with problem question first. The way I, I structure it is generally um, do it chronologically according to the problem. So I know there are a lot of different ways that there are a lot of different people saying, oh, you should group it by issues, you should group it by um, parties. I generally just do it chronologically as the issues appear. This is simply because you don't want to miss issues. And, and I find that is the best way not to miss anything that is on the question, but you, because of your structuring, you, you just end up missing miss the, the opportunity to address it. So that's what I normally do. And then um, I think um, to structure it better, and then I'll, I'll really highly recommend using headings. Um, this is something, especially in like in a post-COVID time when you can type your assignments rather than doing an actual exam, like use headings, like make sure you have heading one and then li list out your elements very clearly so that, and then you start to put in your notes, like you can just do dot points at the beginning, like just transfer across what you have on your notes. Um, like I'm sure you have been taught IRAC by now. Um, so issue, and then you identify an issue and then you put your rules from your um, readings, transfer it across and, that's how I would structure it first. And then finally, like after you dot point the whole um, assignment per se, then, then you can probably transfer it into like, like into proper sentences and work on how to express your thoughts better. So I think that's how I would structure a problem question. Um, obviously uh, there are so many academics and lecturers out here, so I'll, I'll probably let them speak to you about how to do it in a proper way probably. Um, I'd, I agree with what Gordon said. It may be that some areas of substantive law do provide a, a structure for you to follow. So talks obviously would kind of make sense to ask, is there a duty? Has the duty been breached? Has damage been suffered? Is there causation? And then finally damages. Um, perhaps criminal law, you know, the, with respect to each offence, you'd have to work your way through the elements and it might make sense to begin with, well, did the defendant do the act? You know, in a murder case, did the defendant do an act? Was there a death? Um, did the act cause the death? And then move on to the, to the mental states. So some areas of substantive law might, might impose, you know, provide a structure for you to follow. Um, it may be that, Gordon, you were talking more about exams where you do have to, what's absolutely crucial in an exam, as Gordon said, is that you, get, you know, spot as many issues as you possibly can. If it's a take home assignment problem, then obviously you've got, you've got more time to make sure you do get all the issues and you've also got more time to, you know, put it into a nice structure. But as Gordon suggested, yeah, the, the really key thing, particularly in an exam, is to, you know, spot as many issues as you can and give, give some treatment to, to each issue that you spot. Because obviously, if you miss, issues, you can't get any marks for them, you know, and it, you may be throwing away quite a few marks because you've missed a couple of key issues. If I could um, make a comment, Sinem, yes, Maddie, thank you. Oh, yeah, uh, just adding to what was said, I think, uh, of course, with the um, essay, or sorry, the problem type of assignment, it, I think, it, again, you've got to get guidance from 
your, your convener who will usually give you some hints about what they want. But I think as a general rule, what you must avoid, and this happens, is what I call fishing expeditions. That somebody just looks at the at the problem and says, oh, this raises this particular issue. And then they, they, they give us a whole, you know, statement of, you know, the law that relates to that particular issue without honing it back into the issue and resolving it. Well, that, that doesn't get you anywhere. I mean, I've seen this again and again. So really, when you, it is a question of identifying issues. So legal problems are intelligently designed for that purpose. And then um, it's a question of identifying the issues and then resolving the issue as you go along. And in resolving the issue, it's not just stating the law, but then resolving the issue as it results to the, as it relates to the facts. So you've got to keep coming back to the facts, applying the law that you've identified as being an issue and applying that to the facts and then move on to the next one, but always stay close to the facts. Um, finally, I should just wanted to add uh, that the, um, the amount of time you spend on each issue is a reflection of, or should be a reflection of how difficult the particular issue is. So some issues might be straightforward. You just should deal with them in a straightforward way, move on. Other issues require more attention. And that is a test often that we set for students to determine, do they see this or don't they? So the fishing expedition exercise won't work. Uh, and you see it again and again, or simply copying and pasting what you've sort of got in your notes to the answer to a particular issue and a problem often misses misses the issue. Just finally, there are often the subtle issues that lecturers purposefully put in to assist those students that have put in those extra yards that, so that they can identify them and, and, and be, you know, rewarded as it were. So within each problem intelligently designed, there'll be issues there which are there for everybody, but there'll also be issues that really the ones that have put in that extra effort will see. So be on the lookout, take time. Finally, I know I've spoken a bit, but finally, don't rush into answering the problem. Spend time looking at the problem, especially if you've got the time, obviously not in an exam, um, to structure a, a, a good answer. I think that's all I wanted to say there. Okay, thank you, Professor. That was very insightful. Um, so Gordon, this is a question for you. So. I'm really struggling to begin an assignment. So how would you um, suggest that I get the ball rolling? Do you have any tips or tricks that you usually use? Um, I think it really depends on what's, um, what's the obstacle, like what, why are you struggling to begin an assignment? Is it just mere procrastination or, or is it you don't understand the content? But, but in any case, I think the, the, the most general, like general tip or, or the thing that I would advise is to read the question as soon as it comes up, even if the content um, is not taught in class. Um, you'll be surprised that by keeping the question at the back of your mind, um, you, you will keep reflecting and thinking about it in, in, in the most expected time, like whether it's on a train, whether you're doing a general reading, whether you're in class. And then when the relevant content comes up, it will remind you, like your brain will automatically remind you of, oh, that's the, that's the thing that is relevant. This is the content that can be relevant to my assignment. And then you will want to follow up on it. And this, I think for myself, like speaking from personal experience, at least like this motivation of realizing that, oh, this is relevant and I want to follow up on it will get me started. Um, and other more like general tip, I'm sure like probably most people have talked to you guys about this is to really um, plan it and split things into smaller chunks. So for instance, for an essay, like I'm currently doing my honours, like the way I approach it is I research and I write. I research and I write. So like you split into one issue, you research on that issue. Once you have enough, you start writing. So you have a sense of accomplishment. Like, okay, you, you'll be more calm that, okay, I have 500 words for my 2000 words assignment now, I can research more. Rather than research a bunch and you don't know where to start, just start first. It's okay, you will have time at the end to put it back together nicely. It will only take a day or two to like put it into like coherent, a coherent essay, but it's more important that you tell yourself that you have something already and you, you keep wanting to do it. So like the best advice to how to start is actually to start and start writing, not just to read a lot and not to write. So that's at least the advice that I can give, I suppose. No, 
Fair enough. And I think that whole concept of just starting is really the answer sometimes because we we often get so scared that we don't know enough yet, we haven't read enough yet, we haven't caught up with our lectures yet, and then we never end up starting the assignment. That makes us more stressed. So I think just bringing your, I'd say pen to paper, but it's actually just fingers to keyboard and just doing, just starting. Yeah, definitely ripping the Band-Aid off and getting over that fear as best as you can, expose yourself to the assignment, and then you warm up to the assignment and you get into a flow state. Um, but yeah, does anyone else have anything to say about this? Uh, I think it is something students would be going through right now, but um, does anyone else from the panel have anything to say? Nope. nope. Yes, just very quickly, just yes, don't, don't psych yourself out of doing problems. And I think that's, that is a major issue. It's often just a question of confidence. Um, of course, there's the other lifestyle issues that if you're unfortunately not, you know, disciplined enough, you're going to have this problem. But I'm referring to the one where students psych themselves out. And one of the things I tell students for exams, especially, is be kind to yourself. Like when you first see a, a problem, whether it's in an assignment or an exam, the first tendency is to panic and you say, what, what, what's this about? Uh, that's okay. Give yourself uh, 10, 20, 30 seconds to panic and then get over it and then say, oh, look, actually, I can do this. Just go back to first principles. Um, I think it's important to back yourselves. I mean, the mere fact that you're at this law school indicates very high intelligence and clear ability. So just say that to yourself, I can do that. And that often does get rid of the procrastination. And the point you made, Sinem, about you do feel a lot better once you get into it. Don't just leave it sitting on your desk and you panic about it. And it's amazing how much better you feel. And this happens in everything in life, really. That's a challenge. Once you just sit down to it and the relief that you feel and you think oh, actually this is good so I just want to give that positive message to you that you can do it don't don't leave it definitely thank you so much um, we'll go on to the next question which is for David uh, this question is do I need to cite everything I write what if it's an original thought um, well there's you cite you provide citations for different reasons of course. In law, if you're making a statement of law, you should provide authority for it. Um, if you're writing a more critical piece, an essay, for example, then you may be, um, you know, drawing on a wider range of sources, not just primary sources, but also secondary sources. And the, the, the principle there is that wherever you're using someone else's idea, whether it's a direct quotation or not, you should attribute that idea to them because otherwise, as, as Ed explained earlier, you know, you may get yourself into difficulty in terms of education integrity. So wherever you are using someone else's ideas, you know, you should cite them, you should cite, it's appropriate to cite them. There's other situations in which you might want to provide references as well. I mean, it may be that you're making, you are making an original point, you're making some observation about the law, and you just simply want to, you know, illustrate that the point the, the observation you're making has empirical some empirical basis so you might want to you know cite a range of authorities which which are illustrations of the observation that you're making so there's a yeah there's a variety of different reasons why you might cite what what where you where you should provide references if you do have an original point to make and so you can't cite you know there's no references to cite for that you should try and flag that in the way in which you, you know, write your, your essay. You know, so you could talk about people that have, have been working in this area and then just note essay, well, a point that seems to have been missed by these commentators is as follows. You know, so you can clearly signal that this is an original thought with you. It isn't just that you failed to provide an appropriate reference. You'd have to, you have to be careful, of course. I mean, it may be that the observation you're making has been made elsewhere and you're just not, you know, you haven't, you haven't come across the commentator that, that has made that point previously. Um, that, that's okay though, you know, you might, if, if your examiner is aware that perhaps the reference, you know, should have been provided there. Um, it's okay if, you know, you're not expected to read everything. There's a limit to how much you can read. And provided that 
you're not actually um, using their work without appropriate reference, you'll be on safe ground. If it's simply the fact that, yes, someone else, another commentator has made this observation and you haven't come across their work, so you can't cite them, that will be, that should be apparent to the examiner. You know, that'll be apparent to them because you'll, you will have expressed the idea in a different way, in your own way. It's, it's often pretty clear to examiners where work has been copied without proper reference. Yeah, and just while we're on, on referencing, um, do you recommend that we kind of cite as we go or leave a day at the end to get um, all the referencing and bibliography done? I suppose <laughs> it's, um, or a couple of days, it depends um, if, if you're doing assignment where all you have to do is a case name in brackets, that mm. is obviously easy to do as you go. But if you're flowing and you're writing and it's going well, you don't always, at least I don't like to kind of stop and then go, okay, what's the page number, what the year, and then like kind of do that formulaic task while I'm trying to be more creative. But do mm. you think that um, there's a middle ground between referencing as you go and all at the end, maybe once a paragraph's done or what would you recommend is like the most economical way to do that? Yeah, well, economical, I think is, is a good term here because you don't want to waste time, you know, putting references into AGLC for compliant form and then to throw them away, you know, because it turns out you've got too many words, so you need to discard a few paragraphs. Um, so I, I mean, my own practice is to fix up the references at the end because that is more efficient, that is more economical with time. I'm not wasting, I'm only, you know, fixing up the references that are going to be in the final version, so it's more efficient. What you do have to be careful about, though, is where you have, you know, quoted from someone or used someone's idea and you forget to put the reference in at the end. So make a note, wherever you're using someone else's idea, as you're preparing a draft, make a note you know you don't have to put it in AGLC for compliant form obviously at that point it's enough simply to say you know for example if, if, it's a, if it's a secondary source author's name and page number you know that's that's another thing you don't want to be you know searching for that quote where the hell did I get that from I just can't remember and you know having to read the whole book again so just make a note of the of the source and you know paragraph number or page number so that you can then fix it up at the end Thank you. On that point, can I jump in quickly? Just um, so there are also like um, technology out there, like Zotero or EndNote that you can use. And I highly recommend, I, I, did, I wasn't introduced to them until I started my own this this year. And I do not know why I wasn't introduced to them in first year. So basically it really saves you a lot of time and um, it will then disturb your train of thought. You literally have to press the Zotero button and then it, and you put in, like put like literally put in the first name of the author and then it will automatically do it in AGLC for you. Um, of course, like it's not entirely accurate. Like sometimes, like especially with international sources, it can be a little bit off. So you have to fix it up at the end, but at least you get that done, like, like get 80% of it done while you're doing it. So you won't stress about it towards the end. So I think that's something um, uh, everyone can consider. Um, if you need any help, just go to the librarians. They're very happy to help you. So I had a very quick tutorial at the beginning of the semester. So it was great. Yeah, perfect. I think that's genuinely really helpful. Um, so we're almost at the end of the panel. So just as a last question, um, what are your general tips on assignments? And this is just an open question. This is to us, is it? To yes. The panel? yes, yes, just feel free to, yeah, anyone can jump in. Well, I was just going to say, I think there's not much really that can be added to what's been said. Um, the only tip I would make is that take them very seriously um, in the sense that almost put yourself in the frame of mind that let, don't just think of the assignment, especially if it's a legal problem, as um, something that I'm going to be assessed on. Uh, pretend that this was actually a client came to you with this problem and that you were going to advise them on this and that the consequences were much more impactful than merely a mark uh, on a paper but in real life the advice you give to these legal problems have tremendous consequences for people's lives um, whoever you're representing and in one sense that turns it into something higher 
than a mere assessment task, if you know what I mean. So I think if you can psych yourself to do that, and secondly, can I just say this, so that it doesn't appear to be an unpleasant task, try to make it an enjoyable task. Try to say, well, this is what I'm here for. This is what I'm learning. This is the point. Let me see if I can enjoy it. And half the battle there is to get out of your mind this obsession with marks that has crept into the law school over the years, certainly very different when I was a student, if I can say this. Having said that, I understand the pressures on you and jobs and the rest of it. I, I do get that. But to the extent where an obsession with marks starts to impact on your the quality of your work, then you've got to put it in its place. It is important, but it's not the most important thing. And let me say this to you, one of the things I have noticed again and again is the people that have shone in practice, the absolutely outstanding lawyers, are the ones who were less obsessed with marks, maybe didn't do as well as others, but what was going on in their minds while I was at law school is absorbing as much as possible, which then bore fruit down the track. Um, so take what you wish from that. But my critical point is don't psych yourself out, try to enjoy it and keep a balanced view and don't be over obsessed with marks. Keep, it is important, but keep that concept in, um, in balance. Okay. Um, I, a comment that I'd make as, as a kind of a final comment, and this perhaps reiterates something that Peter said earlier, with problem questions, the devil is often in the detail. Um, you know, pay attention to the precise facts of the problem because small differences in facts can totally turn around, you know, the, the likely legal solution. So, you know, don't just, you know, spot an issue and write everything that you know about that issue, about that, about that principle of law without thinking about, well, what's the, what, what are the facts? How, how exactly was that issue raised? And, and what are the exact legal ramifications of that precise, you know, factual detail? So the devil is in the detail, pay attention to the, to the detail of the facts in problems. Um, for me, I think like most, like ever, I think I'm sure this whole session covered a lot of very good tips and advice already. And um, I just want to follow up on um, a point that Professor Durangelos made. Um, I remember him making the same point in our federal constitutional class, and it is that um, assignments are generally very, like, relatively lower weighting. They're designed for you to start engaging with the content before um, the final exam. So use it as a, as a exercise to sort of engage with the task and reflect on how, how you did in, in the midterm to improve for the final exam. And um, as a nerd and and really regrettably someone who cared about his way way too much in the first few years of my law degree, I've done the exercise, I've done the maths for you. So the maths is that even if you completely stuff up this assignment and your mark is for your entire degree is lowered by 10 marks, that is like from your 75 to 65, the total, like your entire whim is only affected by a mere 0 0.4. So don't, don't dwell on the fact that you didn't do well in an assignment after like, after, like obviously treat it as serious as you can before it's due, but after it, just take it as an opportunity to learn and improve and don't dwell on it. And um, yeah, so it's more important for you to understand law and improve and do well in the final exam and also to learn the actual law so you can use it in practice rather than like dwelling in that inconsequential few marks you lost in an assignment. So that's the only final thing I would like to say. I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it was a really great talk. Thank you so much to the panelists for being here. I just want to open up in the last three minutes, any questions that anyone had, maybe they want to turn on their microphone and ask something. I'll leave a little awkward silence now. Hi guys, I had a quick question, which I think um, might be beneficial. I just quickly, my name is Jay. I'm also part of the education committee here. Um, as we all know, part of the law school here does a heavy focus on final examinations um, throughout most of the subjects and a lot of the time they account for a significant proportion of the overall marks for a unit. Um, just quickly, and often these uh, exams are in shorter time frames, such as three hours or shorter, uh, what are your just quick general tips on 
approaching these final examinations and working backwards from there into your unit of study. David, go ahead. Are you going to say something? Um, yeah. I was actually going to say, yeah. I'm afraid I've got to leave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've, got, I've got another meeting to go to. All right. So I, was just, I was just wondering whether I should type that in or, or break in to the session and, and make that observation. So, okay. um, so back to you, Peter. All right. Well, quickly. Thanks, everybody. And um, yeah, I hope, you know, best of luck for, for your legal studies. And as has been commented in the, in the chat, you know, and as, as Peter's mentioned, please, you know, lecturers, academics are very open to... Um, and enjoy students asking them questions. So if you do have questions in, in your units, don't, don't hesitate to get in touch with your, with your unit coordinator or your tutor or your lecturer. Okay, thanks a lot. See you next time. Cheers. Okay. No, thanks, David. I was just going to answer quickly Jay's question. I understand, Jay, that there is a... Um, isn't there a session that will support some exams, which I'm, normally, I'm always a part of, but very quickly, Jay, critically, adopt that attitude that you're taking to a legal problem and start preparing for the examinations early. And that's one of the reasons, for example, that I always set a compulsory uh, midterm assignment is so that students don't complacently just walk into exam and then get a shock. Because um, it's critical that you start preparing early. Um, and the same approach that you take to a legal problem assignment, you take to an examination. But remember, the time frame is shorter. Personally, I regret that we have to have these examinations. I think there are better ways to assess students, but there's many reasons, not the least of which is integrity reasons, which has become a real issue. So if I can just add before going on, integrity is not just a problem for the reason stated. Integrity is also a problem because it is becoming such a problem that it may well result in universities going back to 100% personal sit down examinations because that's the only way that we can ensure integrity. Now, I don't want that to happen at all. And to show you that the approach I take in my elective, I don't have an exam. I have a, um, a long research essay if students want to do that or a mood, an oral mood combined with written submissions because I think that's a better way. But yes, Jay, but if you have particular problems because we're running out of time, but I'm very happy to answer your any individual question you have that and come back if you want me to send them to an exam session. But I'm conscious of the fact that students may want to ask questions, so I won't say anything anymore. No, that's so fine. Um, uh, yeah, we will be having an exam technique session on the 8th of April. And yeah, Peter, I'll be in touch um, about potentially having you on that panel. Uh, happy, to, happy to help if you want me, yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just anybody else has any questions, if you're, if you need to go, that's all good. This is still being recorded. Awesome. And just remember that this panel will be available on souls.org.au uh, and I've linked the education programs way of getting into that as well. So yeah, I think we can wrap it up. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have been asked and hopefully this has been of some help. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank Everyone. you, Gordon, as well.